Okay, I imagine you guys have questions from Chapter 5, am I correct? Yes. Good. What questions do you have? I like questions. Um, why me? Oh, why me? <laughs> one, one of the groups. 123 through 179 would be great. I mean, I, I know we probably already done those two or three other times, but uh, we're going to cover any that we have to so get caught. about the unsteady problem? There's an unsteady problem, yes. Okay. I believe that these are, what are these doing? Are they doing good, Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. All right. Let's see. Did we work 123 before? I think we did. It looks yeah. Good. Well, we started, uh... Let me ask you this. Where did you get stuck on? Well, we start to go through 121, 134, or 134. Trying to find the internal energy in state 2. Internal energy in state 2. Okay. That's where I got stuck. I don't think we did 123. Well, I think the key is to realize that the internal energy in state oh, 2. And uh, let's see what it's like. Well, that depends. You need the quality in state 2, right? Have you already found the quality in state 2? Or you should that. Well, I mean, it tells you it's all vapor. Okay. So then you just look up U sub G. Uh -huh. That'll be the internal energy in state two. Because then you're out of the gas. That's the concept that just keeps kicking me Yeah, down. I know. It will everybody. It confuses everybody. It's normal. Okay, so what else confuses you about? I guess uh, what, like the, what's, what mass is coming in, what's going out. Is there any mass going out? Else? One point zero. That's the mass one in. Mass one in, right? Okay. So, what did you do to the conference to figure out how much mass comes in? I drew a picture. And then <laughs> you drew a picture. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. So, with an arrow going into a pipe from the state two, the mass in. Okay. What constrains the amount of mass that comes in? I would say that valve. Okay, well, let me, let me back up. Let's pretend for a moment that we don't have mass in the end and we want to boil off the water. What do we do? Add heat. Add heat. We add thermal energy, right? So we add thermal energy. What's going to constrain the amount of thermal energy that we need to add? The pressure inside the tank? Basically, the amount of water you have to boil off, right? The more water you have to boil off, the more energy you have to but there's more to it than that. Because you're not just making a deposit of energy. You also have to provide the energy for the boundary work. Remember that piston's going to move up? So there's two things. So what we've been dancing around here is an energy balance. So what you have to do is write an energy balance for the system. And that's what constrains the amount of mass that comes in. Because basically that mass is coming in and giving up just as much energy as it can so that it ends up in the saturated vapor state. Make sense? Now some of that energy is going to go to boil off the water, some of it's going to go into boundary work. So basically the, the key is that, um, let's see, energy in less energy out equals change in energy of the system. Same thing. I mean, no, there's nothing wrong with you guys still asking these questions. These are still good questions. Um, so don't, I'm not trying to embarrass you by saying we've gone over this several times. I'm just saying this is the central thing. Right? This is what you really have to wrap your head around. Energy in. How does energy come in? Well, the only way it comes in is by the mass that comes in times the enthalpy of the incoming strain. Now, to me, this is the important part. Okay, this is the whole idea. But to, to, to use that idea, you have to fill in all the little pieces. You've got to get all the pieces of the puzzle to put them together. But we already know how those pieces are going to fit. Okay, this is our guide. This is like the, the picture on the front of the puzzle box. Okay. So one of the little pieces of the puzzle we have to discuss is, how do I know to use enthalpy here and not internal energy? It's moving. It's moving, right? There's slow energy. It's moving through a pressure, a specific volume is moving through a pressure. So, sure enough, there's flow energy. So this accounts for the thermal energy as well as the flow energy that's coming in being carried by that mass strain. Am I talking about a rate here or am I talking about an amount? 
of the amount, right? This is not the rate at which something comes in. This is just the total amount. All the mass that comes in times the enthalpy that that mass carries with it. That's what this term refers to. Are there any other ways that energy comes into this system? That's it. You're right. That's it. There's no other ways that energy comes in. So let's move on and talk about energy out. How does energy leave the system? Or does it at all? Boundary work. Boundary work. Boundary work right? That's the only way. So minus boundary work. Now, once again, this is another little puzzle we have to solve. We've got to figure out how to write down what boundary work is. You know, or how much there is. Or have some way. We can't just leave it here as boundary work. That probably won't work very well. Okay. Anyway, that equals the change in energy of the system. So once again, this is like your account balance change. Okay. We, we end up with some mass in state two that's more than the mass in state one with some internal energy which you guys have already discussed and decided that would be use of g in state two right? okay. less the mass in state one times the internal energy in state one notice i can't write use of f or use of g here because it's a mixture of okay. but this is what constrains the amount of mass uh, the amount of mass that comes in because look Let's move this boundary work to the other side. And then what you see is that all the energy that comes in, what does it have to do? It has to provide the boundary work and move the system from state one to state two. It's kind of like saying, what all does your paycheck have to cover? I mean, your paycheck comes in, right? Your paycheck has to cover the bills that go out plus the change in your account value. Okay? When you get paid, it's a nice feeling because one day you don't have money, the next day you've got money, right? and the bills start seeping out. And for a little while, for a nice precious little while, there's a change in your account balance. So but surely then withdrawals keep the moving around and you're using that quick start. Anyway. Unless you're on a budget. Unless you're on a budget. Well, you're budget, you, you tell me about that before you go. What's that? Or you don't know what you pay. Or you don't know what you pay. Oh, yeah. You just get some there. I think you should have one in account. We are in accounting. No, it's just energy accounting. Yeah. <laughs> we're accounting for mass and energy. That's all we're doing in this class. Nothing more, nothing less. Okay. Now, how does this constrain it? Well, basically, once we solve this, we're done. Now, you can write this a couple of different ways. There's also a mass balance that we need to include. Okay. The, mass, the amount of mass in state two is more than the mass in state one. In fact, the mass in state two is equal to the mass in state one plus whatever mass comes in. Since we're interested in how much mass comes in, I think I'd take this and substitute it in here so I don't have to worry about the mass in state two. Okay. That's what I think you have to find with the mass to finish the uh, mass in state and I think that's what they asked for in part B, wasn't it? Yeah, the mass of steam is steam that has energy. I was getting better. I was getting nervous ran out of time. I really got to pick up. If you guys want to give it to the money, that's fine. Thank you, Larry. I, really was, I was looking at it, I was getting there, so I realized that I couldn't solve straight away for MI. I realized that I had two unknowns in the energy balance. And I had just written down the max balance. You know, MI plus M1 equals M2. Some of the times it seems like the max balance is so obvious you don't really want to write it down. No, you've got to write it down. Right now. But, it's, but you have to use it. It's still an equation to help you out. Don't be shy to write it down. Definitely write down the easy stuff first. <laughs> okay? So like I said, if you guys want to give it to me Monday, that's fine. It's not a problem. I want you to learn. We still need to have our quizam. What, uh, next week? Uh, it's next week. I think we decided to push it off by a week. We should have another quizam over chapter one. Okay. <laughs> so that we're not having a quizam. Oh, that's even better. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, so, we don't so are you going to do, is it going to be one problem? It's going to be chapter five has been long. You've got steady and unsteady problems. That's true. It will be one problem. So it's going to be unsteady and <laughs> steady problem. I didn't say that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's going to involve mass. It's going to involve mass and their energy. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm going to do one or the other. You better study both. I mean, that's, that's really all I. The rest of it, I can, I can tackle the rest of it. I just need to keep remembering that, you know, just because there's a phase change doesn't mean there's a temperature change. But, and I know that, but I don't know it when it comes time to work the problem. I didn't know that until. Yeah, well, it 
just keeps biting me in the ass. Eventually you'll recognize it. Oh, no, I'll go through enough pain. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's all I'm going to treat that shit. <laughs> all right, so what's next? You said you wanted to see more on the other problems as well. Really, really quick while I'm thinking about it, what are we going to start on the projects? Well, I think that you guys really need information from chapters 6 and 7 before you can really do anything on the project. So my goal was to get through those, not necessarily even through the quiz ams for those chapters, but just through those so that you guys can start the project. Now, it's getting cold. About this time, the sun's pretty much not giving us hardly any energy, right? Yeah. And so I don't know that the um, uh, Fresnel lenses are really going to work all that well for us. So I have a proposal. How about if at this point we change our thermal source so we could use a propane torch or something, okay, some type of flame? Okay. That way we can sense the effect a lot better. Okay. So we'll use that now. What that means is you're going to have to include a safety valve in your project, and you will need a pressure relief valve. We don't make steam boilers anymore. So essentially, what this is without a pressure relief. So we're going to have a pressure relief valve on uh, ammonia. System. Yes. Because I would rather since uh, the uh, how, how was, yeah, I would rather have a chance to get away from the toxic chemical than to have shrapnel going through my body that I cannot outbreak. Now, you know, if, if ammonia gets too high of a uh, pressure, it does lead to the area where it's longer with that. However, uh, in talking to a few people about this, Professor Cool is more familiar uh, with this stuff because having worked in the food processing industry, they used ammonia refrigeration all the time. Now, he's more familiar with vapor compression refrigeration not with absorption of refrigeration. But he said, you know, actually the toxicity limits of ammonia at the level of kill you, you can't hardly stand in the room with it because your nose is telling you that there's just too much of it. So I really don't think we're going to have a problem with us being exposed to the ammonia and, you know, dying toxic. <laughs> just but that if, it, if it explodes, if it blows up, we wouldn't be in the room anyway because at that concentration, we couldn't stand that's what we should make. This is thermodynamics. We should blow something up. Uh, well, we we still need a We still We still might. Well, let me tell you guys one thing real quick. You know the difference between civil engineers and mechanical engineers? Civil engineers build and mechanical engineers like tear Almost. Civil engineers build targets and mechanical oh, engineers okay. build weapons. Right? <laughs> <laughs> it's supposed to say it the other way. <coughs> mechanical engineers build weapons, civil engineers build targets, and it actually sounds fun. Okay. That's why I'm teaching and not making comedy. Alright, so any other questions on the unsteady problems you guys really want to see or have burning questions about? I'll just look at it well, it's okay. I'd rather look at it in class because if you're asking about it, there's other people too. So I want to reinforce the important part. I don't want to go through the whole solution, but I want to help you over the top where you're stuck. Well, maybe <coughs> 134. Let's go. Okay, 134. Okay, so I assume you started this one. I quit after I didn't You quit after you read it? Okay. All right. I think I thought it was this list for it may help to think of this problem as just a piston cylinder device because that's essentially what it is. Okay. All that's happening is that we've got a flow in, a flow out. <coughs> and boundary work because there's more flowing in than what's flowing out. So the temperature and the pressure in the balloon are constant. So that's kind of nice, right? Because we know temperature and pressure at any point in time. So even though it's an unsteady problem, that simplifies things a whole lot. Because the, the quick shortcut way is to realize that this is a constant pressure process. So all you really need to do is find volume in step one and step two, which is actually pretty straightforward using mass balance. And then you can find the boundary. You actually don't have to use an energy balance in this problem to solve it. I just solved it in class 
uh, both ways, one's with an energy balance and one with uh, just the mass balance to show you that it could be done either way. Anything else on this problem that really confused you? Or anyone? I'm going to pop them and go there and work them. I'm going to go there and work them. I don't need more. So just do it like them? You can do it like a piston? Exactly. Right. Because all that's happening is it's going to that balloon is, is expanding, mm -hmm. which means that it's pushing the atmosphere out there. Mm -hmm. What else? He talks about some interesting things and he delves into entropy. I think it's a good discussion that he goes through. So I think it's worth showing. Uh, but we'll do that a little bit later if you guys are falling asleep because I'm trying to derive entropy or something and it's really very boring. But uh, we talked about how Joule performed his famous experiment, experiment and then showed that the amount of energy in an ideal gas depends on the temperature of that ideal gas. But we realized that something important happened because um, once you've released the pressure from one tank to the other, you've got a high pressure tank and a evacuated tank, and you release the pressure from one to the other, you've destroyed something. There's, there's less capability of doing something with that, that compressed air because it's not as high, at as high pressure as it was. So something has disappeared. It's not the energy. The energy is still there. In fact, energy is always conserved. And in this case, even though the energy is conserved, what happens is the, the, the capability of that energy, our, our ability to do something with that energy has been decreased. So we have to consider what's going on here. And we're going to go through chapter 6 fairly quickly because it's fairly light. It's chapter 7 where we really define entropy mathematically. And don't worry about the definition, but I'll just show you how to use it. That's the important part. But this is the background word for it. And what we have to do, first of all, is define a thermal energy reservoir. Now you can think of this as a water reservoir. Okay. You take some water out of the reservoir, the amount of water in the reservoir doesn't change by a significant amount. Okay. In a thermal energy reservoir, if you take out some thermal energy, the amount of thermal energy in the reservoir doesn't change, and its temperature doesn't change. Same thing with the sink. So we talked about Calvin and Hobbes sitting in a room where the TV is on, and there's heat coming off the TV, but the temperature of the air in the room doesn't change significantly. So essentially the air in the room is serving as a thermal energy reservoir. Well, it turns out when we go and visit a power plant, which I'm still working on, uh, we're getting closer. I called uh, Duke Energy the other day, and the person I talked to promised me they would uh, look into it and get back with me. So if they have gotten back with me in a couple days, I'm going to call them again. Get their name this time. <laughs> I think that'll be more effective. Anyway, what you'll see, and you may not, you, you won't see it laid out this way, but somewhere they will, they will have a boiler because they're burning coal. And they will have waste heat rejection. And essentially what happens here is they have a thermal energy source. Okay, and that's the boiler where you're burning coal to maintain the temperature. So the temperature never changes, even though you withdraw thermal energy from that source. And they'll have a sink. Now, I think I read that the Gallagher station, the new plant that I want to go to, I believe they said <coughs> they exhaust their waste heat into the river. But I'm not sure about that. I didn't look at it then. So I thought it was interesting. But anyway, so they, if you were to exhaust waste heat into the, the river, well then, uh, uh, the, the temperature of the river, since it's so large, is not going to change significantly, okay? even as large a plant as they have there. So anyway, there's a thermal energy source and a thermal energy sink, and what happens is thermal energy comes into the boiler and basically boils off liquid that comes in. It's going to be water that's separated from the boiler. Okay, so you've got water under high pressure, the water would be turned to steam in the boiler, it's actually superheated. It would go through the turbine, producing work and decreasing pressure in the process and temperature. 
and then come back through the condenser where the steam is converted back into liquid to be pumped back up. Now you might look at this and say, well, if you want steam here, why would you bother condensing it here when you're just going to put it back through and turn it into steam again? It seems like a waste, right? Because you guys know now that when you have a phase change, you're taking out a lot of energy here, right? This is steam. You're converting it to liquid. So that's a lot of energy. Why on earth would you do that? Well, the reason you would do that is because it takes a lot less electricity, a lot less pump work to pump the liquid back up to the boiler pressure than it would take to pump the vapor or compress the vapor back up to the boiler pressure. That's why they do this. Okay? And that's the advantage that your absorption refrigeration cycle is going to have. Instead of having a compressor, like all of our homes have for air conditioning, instead of having a compressor for taking the uh, vapor refrigerant back up to a high pressure, what we're going to have is a pump in the absorption refrigeration refrigerator where it, that pump will require very little electrical work to pump a liquid back up to the high pressure side. Yes? Why wouldn't they have some type of system before the condenser and before the boiler that was connected to try to recycle some of the thermal energy? They do. And once we, if we get to the point... Of course they do. I thought I was going to be a million. <laughs> well, when I think of an idea and they've already done it, I think, hey, my ideas are pretty good. I just got to keep going. They do. If we get to the chance, uh, if we get a chance to talk about uh, vapor power cycles, we'll find all kinds of ways of regeneration. A lot of times what they'll do is they'll bleed steam off the turbine. They'll actually use that to preheat because it turns out, what we're going to find out is that the efficiency of this device depends on these two temperatures. The farther apart they are, the more efficient it can be. And so essentially what that means is that if you can add heat at a high temperature, then it's more efficient. And if you can extract heat or throw away heat at a low temperature, it's more efficient. And so there's various strategies for making a system do that more. Anyway, the, the, the features of this heat engine, we can simplify it down a little bit and draw a system boundary around it and say, well, basically, we've got a thermal energy source that brings in thermal energy. A fraction of that thermal energy comes out as net work. Because remember, some of this work, you've got to go back and drive the pump, but not much. And this may be a 100 horsepower pump, but when you're producing, uh, 250 megawatts of power, 100 horse, 200 horses is nothing. Okay? But the point is there's a net amount of shaft work that comes out, and then there's also some waste heat rejection. Now, I was reading about the Gallagher plant. It's about 33% efficient. What that means is that of all the energy that they pay for in coal, 33% of it or so comes out as net work, and 66% of it or so is rejected as waste heat. Now, you might say, well, isn't that terrible? Duke is horrible for doing such an inefficient thing. Well, you're driving around in a car that at best is 25% efficient. Okay? So let's not point fingers. You're throwing about 75%. Now, now think of it this way. Every time you put a dollar's worth of gasoline into your car, 75 cents does not go into pushing your car down the road. 25 cents or so does, if you're lucky. Okay. Well, that's a, a discouraging way to look at it, but that's the fact. And one of the reasons the electric cars are such a big push, not only are they actually fun to drive, right, because electric motors have pretty good acceleration, but also, since power plants do things on such large scales, then, the, first of all, the cost of coal per, per unit of energy is a lot less than the cost of gasoline and diesel, because as it doesn't really have to be refined. Okay, but also, and, and we have it in this country, so it's cheap, you don't have to import it from anywhere. But also, uh, because they're dealing with much larger scales of equipment, they can run at better control and higher temperatures, lower pressures, and have a heat engine that's more efficient than the heat engine under the dirty part. Even the so-called dirty coal-fired power plants today, in my opinion, do a lot better uh, than the heat engine under most of our hoods. Okay. So anyways, common features of a power plant like this, it uses a working fluid, in this case water, and then the, the unique, well, the, the common features between all heat engines, they receive heat from a high temperature source, they convert part of that heat into work, not all of it, part of it. They reject the remaining waste heat to the sink, they operate on the cycle, and they usually use a working fluid. There are some heat engines that do not use a working fluid. I don't know if you guys have ever seen memory wire. 
But you can take memory wire and when it changes temperature, it'll go back to the previous shape. I don't know if you can ever go down and get pulled back, but you can use that to make a heat. It's kind of interesting, but not terribly practical or useful. Okay. Okay, so another way of looking at this is that some of the work output has to be recycled back to the pump to keep the pump going and keep the cycle going. So the net amount of work we get out from the system is just the difference from the, the work output versus the work input. Okay, so we produce a, a total amount of work out at the turbine, but some of it has to be extracted to run the pump. Now we can also arrive at an energy balance around the entire system. And note that the heat transfer in less the heat transfer out, less the work out, less heat in, or less work in, is equal to zero. In other words, this is a system operating at steady state. The net deposits and withdrawals are zero. The amount of energy in the system doesn't change. So the net work output is just the difference between the heat flows. Another way of looking at this is if it comes in as thermal energy, and does not leave as thermal energy, it must leave as an amount of network. Because you can't store it. So we have to talk about performance or efficiency. Performance will always be defined in this class, or efficiency will always be defined as desired output over required input. Always, no exception. So in drag racing, performance is distance per time. It's whoever accomplishes the most distance, which is the desired output, over the least part of the time. In track racing, what you're really interested in is speed per time, or essentially acceleration. Because in track racing, you don't just have a straightaway where whoever has the biggest engine and the least weight wins. What you have is a, a, a situation where you have to corner. You can't uh, just accomplish maximum speed around the entire track. So you actually want to accelerate as much as you can. So what you really want to do is come into the curve as, as high of velocity as you can manage and put on the brakes at the very last instance so you just you know, have the shortest amount of time possible to come down to the, the maximum speed for the take of the court. Okay. So negative acceleration is actually very important. One of the things, if you start souping up your car, one of the things you'll eventually get to is that you've got to increase your brake performance. You've got to have better brakes. And because you'll eventually have such high performance from the engine that the brakes can't handle the load anymore. They heat up too much. So, Deceleration is as important as acceleration in track performance. But also, you learn from dynamics that there's lateral acceleration. When you take the corner, you'd like to take that corner as quickly as possible. Okay. So anyway, I think I showed you guys this in 220. I'll go through it quickly. Basically, GG plots are acceleration plots where you have an accelerometer mounted to the car and you're measuring forward, backward, right, and left acceleration. Okay. And, um, Anyway, so you, you measure that for a driver, the farther away those points are from the center, the more likely it is that that driver is going to win. I think I showed you guys the white zombie electric car in 220, correct? Mm -hmm. I've never seen that. You haven't seen it? No. Well, it's worth watching. It's pretty interesting. Uh, I'm not going to show it in class. I'll just give you the highlights quickly. Uh, basically, I forgot his name, but this guy took a Datsun from the 70s, yanked the engine out of it, and put an electric motor in place. And put some batteries in it. First of all, he was using standard lead acid batteries. And took it to track meets, you know, just uh, individuals that went out to drag race, and won tons of races. And then he made it even better by getting rid of the lead acid batteries and putting in uh, lithium ion, basically uh, uh, batteries like he used in power tools, and won even more races. So he has a fairly light car because it doesn't have the weight of the engine, uh, but a very fast car because he's also reduced the weight of the batteries and he has very high power output. And, you know, and the key to the electric car that makes it win races is the fact that it has very high acceleration. <coughs> Gasoline powered or diesel powered engines don't really have all that high torque at low RPM. Electric motors have plenty of torque at low RPM. So he just, you know, where he wins the race is from the very starting line, he just takes off. There's no problem accelerating from the starting line. So by the time the gasoline engine is spooled up, I mean, it's too late. 
So he sets a lot of records at you know, local tracks. Um, and uh, it's interesting to see him go up and, you know, he's got a sleek eight-cylinder Corvette all tricked out. And the Datsun <laughs> just blows it away. <laughs> you know. He uh, recently broke the 67 Mustang with two faster. Did he? Yeah, interesting. He holds a world record for an uh, electric street vehicle. It's like 178 miles per hour in the standing mile. Wow. Wow. Which beat the previous record by like 20 something miles per hour. Wow. That's amazing. So, electric cars can be fun. In fact, uh, I've seen a video of someone, probably a rich person, that owns a, uh, oh, what is that car? The famous electric car is made on the, the West Coast. The Tesla. Yeah. Tesla, thank you. Now, apparently there's a sports mode in the Tesla, and when you hit it, it really goes. So, anyway, it's worth checking out if you ever get a chance. But I've got the link in the slides if you want to look at it. Okay, so since performance is desired output over required input, you might be a little bit confused because normally you measure fuel economy in miles per gallon, but that's not a very good way of measuring fuel economy. A much better way to measure fuel economy is by uh, work output from the engine over thermal energy input to the engine. Because then you have the same units top and bottom. Does that make sense? Because some fuels have more energy in them than others. So per gallon, per volume of fuel doesn't make a whole lot of sense really. Okay. My thought is a drywall finisher is not very good. I'm starting to hire you out. If I've got something at my house that needs drywall work, I pay for somebody to do it. Because I realize the area that I finished, which was my desired output per week, Pretty poor. Sometimes this was measured in months, not weeks. <laughs> so, it's just not economical. I was better off to go down to Taco Bell for seven dollars an hour and pay somebody. <laughs> I've since learned a few tricks, and I can tell them to you if you ever have to do it. I recommend not doing it. Okay. So anyway, so our measure of performance is desired output over required input, and the way we'll do it is in a non-dimensional way: network output over total. So the thermal efficiency, or the performance, or the efficiency of the heat engine would be the network output from that engine divided by the heat input, not considering the heat output at all. It doesn't matter. What matters is what we had to give it and what we get out of it. That's all we care about. Now, you can rearrange this. If you write an energy balance around this, remember we said that whatever heat comes in and doesn't leave as heat must come out as a net amount of work. So the net amount of work is just the difference in the heat flows. So you can put that in here. Net amount of work is just Q in less Q out. And here's another form for the thermal efficiency of the heat engine. This is really important. This is very useful because it allows us to quantify how good a heat engine is in terms of using fuel. Now, if you, uh, you know, if you have a helicopter that where the engine gets, uh, you know, 100 miles per gallon in theory but the thing can't lift off the ground because the engine is too heavy, that's not the best measure of efficiency for a helicopter, obviously, right? This is just a basic way of measuring uh, thermal efficiency based on energy output in one form versus energy input in another form. That's what we're looking at. So it's more like measuring the fuel economy of your car, not so much the performance of it. Can I beat somebody up and stop fire? All right, so here are the important equations. If you understand all this great, if you don't, here's what's important for heat engines. Now be careful. Some people get confused about this efficiency, this thermal efficiency. They try to use it on something that's not a heat engine, like an air conditioner or a heat pump. That's not what we're talking about. This is just thermal efficiency for a heat engine. We'll have other measures of efficiency for those. Now, we, we talked about the power plant and how they had to throw away so much energy. Wouldn't it be nice if they could save it? Because then they wouldn't have to buy as much coal, and we'd probably get a discount on our rates. Well, if we don't get a discount on our rates, because I doubt they'd ever reduce their rates, maybe at least we could own stock in the company, our stock value would go up, because the profit would go up. Okay, so we'll get them another one. But is there a way to save Q out? Well, let's consider a very simple heat engine. This is just a single piston cylinder device, and we want it to raise a load. Okay, so maybe we're going to use this as an elevator. Okay, simple example, but anyway. We've got a gas here at 30 degrees Celsius. We've got a reservoir that has thermal energy at 100 degrees Celsius. So we can take as much thermal energy from this reservoir as we want, and it'll stay at 100 degrees Celsius. So let's say we pull 100 kilojoules of thermal energy from that reservoir. The reservoir stays at 100 degrees. Okay? What happens then is the temperature of the gas will go up. In doing so, the gas will expand. It'll lift our load. Let's say the load is a weight and the height is such 
that once we have lifted that load, that represents 15 kilojoules worth of potential energy change. Because we pull that weight off, and now we'd like to lift another load. Our elevator needs to come back down. So what could we do? Well, we've got gas at 90 degrees Celsius. We can't avoid getting rid of 85 kilojoules of energy that's still in here. We have no way to return back to 30 degrees Celsius with the piston down other than rejecting the 85 kilojoules of energy. That's the only way we can get back to where we start. I mean, we don't want to build piston cylinder devices for every single load we have to raise. Right? That would be a pressure as well. So, anyway, so we're going to, uh, we have to somehow get this extra 85 kilojoules of thermal energy that we deposited in the bank account out. We can't avoid it. Well, what can we do with it? Could we somehow recycle that 85 kilojoules and put it back into the 100 degrees Celsius reservoir? That would be good. The problem is that it's impossible. The gas is at 90 degrees, the reservoir is at 100. If we put the gas in contact with the reservoir, more energy is going to flow. Out. That won't help. Okay. So we can't do that. It won't work. So what we're saying is that there is no way to avoid this heat rejection. We can never just pull it out and hope that this would work. Okay? We can't take our power plant and just say, hey, guess what, guys? Let's destroy the condenser and pipe it straight through and it won't burn near as much coal. It won't work. And guess what? The fact that the thermal efficiency is less than one is because there is some Q out. If Q out could be zero, this term would be gone and the thermal efficiency would be one or hundred. But we can't get rid of this. There's no way. And the fact that we cannot get rid of this has nothing to do with the friction. If you look on YouTube and people are talking about how to increase the efficiency of their, their engines okay, by reducing friction, well, they've missed the boat. They've missed the main place where energy is lost. In fact, thinking of your car as a system, you have thermal energy that comes in. And how does that thermal energy come in? Well, you put gasoline in your tank, the gasoline goes into the pistons, right? It gets burned, and that's your thermal energy source. Okay? So essentially, think of the gas tank as external to the car. Okay? Once, it, once it comes in and burns, that's your heat input to the car. Now, where's the heat rejection? Because it's just a heat input, so there has to be thermal energy in, there has to be thermal energy out. Where is it? It's up in the engine. It absorbs the heat exhaust. And the exhaust, right? Well, the engine absorbs some of the heat, but I'm talking about a steady state. So in the exhaust, that's where most of your energy loss is, right? A lot of people get confused when they think that most of the energy loss is in the radiator. You've got hot coolant circulating through and you're going to know most of your heat loss is the hot air coming out of the exhaust pipe. And that's where most of, well, practically all of the out occurs in the heat engine under the hood of the All right. So, we're going to work with the Kelvin Planck statement of the second law first. We'll approach the, uh, um, we'll find them. there's two statements of the second law. Uh, anyway, uh, the, their statement is that you cannot, now I'll paraphrase, you cannot take in thermal energy, produce network, and not reject heat. That's basically what they said. At least you can't do it on a cycle. You can't do it over and over. You might be able to do it for one process, but then your system will be in a different state and you can't reuse it. Okay? So that's the, the Kelvin plan. Did you say that again? Sorry? Did you say that again? Sure. You cannot take in a net amount of heat and only produce a net amount of work. The first law has no problem with this. The second law has a problem. Okay? This is the second law, basically, saying that some of this heat, to get it to turn into work, has to be rejected. No way around. Okay, that's their state. So they said this is not possible. Now refrigerators and heat pumps uh, are similar to heat engines. It's just that they work in reverse. You've never seen exactly how a refrigeration system, a vapor compression refrigeration system works. Notice you guys are not building something exactly like this. Basically the compressor section, there's a different design for that. Okay? Instead of having compressors, you guys have some other equipment that includes a pump. But the rest of it's essentially the same. But the way a vapor compression refrigeration cycle works is that you take in a gas, you compress it so that it goes up to high pressure, high temperature. You cool that gas with relatively warm air, whether it's your condenser unit outside, it's using hot summer air to cool down an even hotter gas. 
Or if it's kitchen air in your refrigerator that's cooling down a hot gas that's been compressed. Okay? In any case, this is still relatively high temperature, but the, the surrounding air, which is the normal medium, is at a lower temperature than the hot refrigerator. So the refrigerant comes through, still at high pressure, but now at a lower temperature. What you then allow that refrigerant to do is to expand, and by expanding, the pressure drops, but also the temperature drops. So now it's a really cold refrigerator. You then run that through an evaporator. If this is your refrigerator, then this evaporator coil basically has contact with the air inside the refrigerator cabinet. If this is your air conditioner outside, then this is the evaporator coil that sits outside. It's in contact, I'm sorry, in the house. Excuse me, this is not the condenser, the evaporator. Sits inside your house in the ductwork and cools down the air inside of your home so that your, the, the refrigerant still comes back at about the same temperature, but uh, different, uh, maybe the same pressure. Now, this is not exactly correct because usually what happens is you've got quite a bit of liquid here. And not until all the liquid boils off can the temperature change. There's usually actually a pressure drop through the evaporator. And so the temperature will remain the same, but the pressure will, will uh, uh, drop a little bit. Anyway, it doesn't matter. That's generally how these things work. Now, these can be generalized into similar systems as what we had for the heat, or the heat engines. If for refrigeration unit, you're, you're putting in work to cause thermal energy to move to a warmer space. Okay? Now, the example of a refrigerator in your home, what would that look like? What would be the, the cold space here that you're trying to extract thermal energy from? What would that be? What's inside the fridge, right? Food, the air, everything inside of the refrigerator. What would be the, the high temperature that you're trying to push that energy into? Kitchen air, right? Whatever's around the refrigerator. Maybe you got a refrigerator sitting out in your garage for your beer. The air around it, that's the thermal sink in this case, even though it's at a higher temperature. And what do you have to put in? Well, you have to put in electricity to drive the cycle, to drive the vapor compression of the refrigeration cycle. Now, the goal for a refrigerator or an air conditioner is to remove thermal energy from a low temperature space. That's the goal. Now I have a heat pump in my house, and the way it works is it tries to cool down the outdoors. Actually what it does is it extracts thermal energy from the cold air outside, okay, and then pumps it up to a higher temperature, that's what the compressor essentially does, such that that refrigerant can be cooled by the air in my house. In the process, the air in my house warms up. Does that make sense? If you have a heat pump, it works the same way. The nice thing about having a heat pump is that it can be, with a simple piping change, called a reversing valve, you can run it as a heat pump, you can also run it as a refrigerator or an air conditioning unit. So it works in the summer, it works in the winter. That only works until it gets so cold outside, and that's just not very efficient to use. But notice, the desired result is different for a heat pump than it is for a refrigerator. In a refrigerator or air conditioner, you're trying to remove heat from a cold area. In a heat pump, you're trying to deposit heat into a warm area. That's fundamentally different because our, our measure of performance is desired output over requirement. So just like a heat engine, a refrigerator and heat pump uses working fluid, has common features regardless of whether you're dealing with uh, absorption uh, refrigeration, or like we're going to do, or vapor compression refrigeration, or even if you're dealing with the heat pump, they all work essentially the same way. They receive thermal energy from a low temperature source. They use work to increase the quality, in other words, the temperature of that thermal energy. They reject the high quality heat to a high temperature sink, and they operate on a cycle. So these are common features of all heat pumps and refrigerators. Now, um, something else I wanted to say about this. So here's a refrigerator whose goal is to cool food. Here's a heat pump whose goal is to warm up a house. Okay. Now how would we calculate the efficiencies of these things? I mean this heat pump requires 2 kilojoules of work to move 5 kilojoules of heat, plus notice by an energy balance, the work that comes in, into 7 kilojoules of heat into the home. Here's a refrigerator that's pulling in energy at a rate of 2 kilowatts and moving 360 kilojoules per minute, which we can convert to kilowatts. 
So we could figure out the heat flow rate to the kitchen, but how would we look at the efficiencies of these two? Well, let's generalize them and turn them into thermal sources and sinks for the heat pump and for the refrigerator. And note, once again, that the desired effect, the desired output, now I don't mean literally output from the refrigerator, but the desired result of a refrigerator is moving thermal energy from a refrigerated space. Whereas the, des the desired res result for a heat pump is to move thermal energy into a warm space. Those are two totally different goals. Therefore, when we look at the performance of a refrigerator, we need to take the ratio of the desired output over required input. It can also be written in rate form. The rate at which energy flows from the refrigerated space divided by the rate at which we put work in. Both of those forms will be exactly the same. Now, we call this a coefficient of performance rather than efficiency because it turns out that you can use a small amount of work to move a relatively large amount of heat. And if we didn't use coefficient of performance, we could have a number here larger than here and it would look like we'd have an efficiency greater than 100%. Yes, sir. What is the uh, subscripts L and H again? L is low for the low temperature space. H is high, in other words, referring to the high temperature space. Good question. Now for the heat pump, the goal is completely different. We don't care about QL. I mean, yeah, we'd like to get as much of it as we can, but the goal is QH. So the amount of thermal energy we move into the heated space divided by the network input is our metric for the performance in a heat pump. So notice these are two different things. These are not quite the same, even though they're both basically refrigerators. Since we can write the network input as QH minus QL, which is true for heat pumps and refrigerators, as well as for heat engines, then we can make some simplifications here. We can plug in QH minus QL for the network input. Okay, so making that substitution, you see QL, QH, QL, there's probably a simplification factor is, here's what it looks like. You can do the same thing for the heat pump. Here you have QH over QH less QL. The simplification looks a little bit different. You don't have to memorize these, you have to write them down, you can if you want. They're all in the back of chapter six. In fact, what I'd recommend you do is go to the back of chapter six and find out where they're located so that you can become familiar with them. These are very important equations. Anytime you want to talk about the efficiency or the performance of a heat pump or refrigerator, you're going to use these equations in one form or another. Anybody got a page number at the back of chapter six? 314. 14? Three fourteen and three fourteen. Okay. So there are the coefficients of performance for refrigerators and heaters. You will need them. Now mathematically, just for the fun of it, notice that the coefficient of performance for heat pump is equal to the coefficient of performance for a similar refrigerator plus one. So what this really means is the heat pump could theoretically be a little more efficient than the now the Clausius statement, that's the name I couldn't think of. I knew it started with a C, but I couldn't think of it. The Clausius statement of the second law says that it is impossible to move thermal energy from a low temperature space to a high temperature space with no work input. You have to put work in to make that happen. Do you know how to add, do you know how to increase the efficiency of any device in 100%? No. Add one. Add one. One. Add one. Add another device is what it's saying. No, no, what I'm saying is add one. Add one. How can you add the number one? Well, after you get finished putting in desired output over required input equals this, then you add one. Okay. <laughs> so it's a mathematical way to do it, but it doesn't do anything in the real world. Okay. All right, so the Clausius statement of the second law just says that heat doesn't flow from cold to hot. But you guys know that. You didn't have to take this class to learn, right? You know that from experience. And you probably believe that a lot more than you believe the Kelvin Planck statement. What the Kelvin Planck statement, we go back, is that it's impossible to take in a net amount of heat and produce a net amount of work. We <coughs> look at that and you say, well, I don't know if I believe that or not. But once we got to this point, and you saw that the Clausius statement was something you'd already experienced, you probably said, yeah, I've never seen that happen, so I believe that. It turns out that the Clausius statement and the Kelvin-Planck statement are actually identical to each other. 
Let's consider a heat engine that breaks the Kelvin Planck statement along with a refrigeration unit. So what we're going to do is pretend that Kelvin Planck were wrong and we can take in heat, producing work at 100% efficiency with no rejected waste heat. And we're going to size this refrigerator uh, just so that all the network that comes in pumps QL up to here. So by the energy balance here, what we find is that the energy flow here must be the network plus QL. Okay? But the network here is the heat flow. Okay? These are the same thing. So this flow here is not just network plus QL, it's QH plus QL. Now consider a system where you hide the details of what's going on inside here. It's all just a box. And you'll notice that QH here cancels with the QH portion here, and you have QL flowing without any work input like this, which, is, which breaks the quality state. So if you believe that thermal energy does not flow from cold to hot all by itself, you also believe that you cannot take in a net amount of heat and produce a net amount of work without rejecting any waste. It's kind of interesting. So this brings us into the discussion of perpetual motion machines. I see a comment in the audience. Just slide, when you go back to the sure. slide. Sure. Okay. So when you sit there and you say, if you believe this or if you believe that, it's almost like, you know, do you believe in Santa Claus or the Easter Bunny? Tell me, should I believe in that or not? You mean Santa Claus? You right? should not believe that this is possible. This, girl, this is kind of like this is kind of like saying, if you believe in the Easter Bunny, then you must also believe in Santa. Claus. Don't believe in either one. Yeah, that, that helps me out because they're like, uh, you know, I'll be if you believe this, then you believe this. Right. 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 You tell me to believe it, I'll believe it. Well, that's how it kind of did with Santa Claus when I was <laughs> <laughs> so, Believe it, there's presents out there. They didn't go for it, you know? Yeah. How long did it take you? Nine. Yeah. Days ago. 